Namaste. In the previous class, we looked at the various methods of preparation of alkenes. In today's class, we'll continue further post the preparation. We will be focusing on the properties. And we said when we talk about properties, we'll be primarily focusing on two kinds of properties. The first one is called as physical properties, and the second one is chemical properties. So let's have a look at some of the physical properties of alkenes first. Now, when we talk about physical properties, we are talking about its nature, we're talking about its state, we're talking about its boiling point, melting point, and so on. So let's uh, just quickly go through some of the characteristic physical properties of alkenes. The first three members of alkenes are gases. Now, when you talk about the first three members, is ethene, propene, butene. Yeah. So ethene, propene, and butene. These three members are gases. The next 14 members are liquids, and the higher ones are solids. So you can clearly see with the increase in the number of carbon atoms, their state will change. Second property that we need to understand is ethene is a colorless gas with a faint sweet smell. All other alkenes are colorless and odorless. So it's only ethene which shows some faint smell. Whereas when you look at every other alkene after ethene, they are odorless, but all of them are colorless gases. They're insoluble in water, but fairly soluble in non-polar solvents like benzene and ether. So this just talks about their solubility. Continuing further, with increase of the size of the alkyl group, the boiling point will increase. So with increase of the size of the alkyl group, the boiling point will increase with respect to alkenes. Branch chain compounds have lower boiling point than the straight chain alkenes. So this just talks about what happens to the boiling point when there is a change in the structure from an open chain to a branch chain. So if I have a straight chain, it'll have a higher boiling point. If I have a branch chain, we have a lower boiling point. This leads us to the chemical properties of alkenes. Under chemical properties, one of the first things that we need to understand is alkenes are unsaturated in nature. Now, because they are unsaturated, they have a double bond. Naturally, they have a tendency to become saturated. Now, what is becoming saturated get converted to an alkane. Alkenes will get converted to alkanes via a reaction called as addition reaction. So if I need to convert a double bond into a single bond, the only way I can do that is by adding something from outside. Now, adding something from outside is called as an addition reaction. And that's one of the primary reactions which all unsaturated compounds undergo. Now, which is the first one that we need to understand here? The first one is called addition of dihydrogen. So addition of dihydrogen, as the name itself indicates, we are going to add hydrogens during the course of the reaction. So we will add hydrogen in the presence of finely divided nickel. Now this is the catalyst. Now what is meant by finely divided nickel? Finely divided nickel is nothing but nickel in its powdered form. Now we will understand in catalysis how increasing the surface area of the catalyst will increase the efficiency of the reaction. So hence nickel is taken in the powdered form so that the surface area of the catalyst will increase, thereby increasing the catalytic nature of the catalyst. So we can use finely divided nickel or palladium or platinum. So you can either use nickel, palladium or platinum to convert an alkene into an alkane. Now addition of hydrogen is also called as reduction. So you can consider these reagents as reducing agents too. Well, let's have a look at an example. So this is ethene. When ethene adds on to hydrogen in the presence of finely divided nickel, palladium, or platinum, we get ethane. So we get the corresponding alkane. So pretty straightforward, right? The second one, pretty similar to addition of hydrogen, is addition of halogens. So in the previous example, we added two hydrogens. In this case, naturally, we will be adding two halogen atoms. So 
halogens like bromine or chlorine add to alkene to form vicinal dihalides remember you can be studied two kinds of dihalides in one of the previous classes vicinal dihalide and geminal dihalide so can you guess what is vicinal what is geminal can you try to understand can you try to recollect yeah so this just talks about whether you are able to retain the concepts in your memory or not if you are not able to recollect then the fault lies in lack of practice you will have to ensure every day whenever you go through a lecture like this as soon as you finish the lecture take your book start practicing be it reactions be it the reagent be it the concepts start practicing as once you start practicing you will retain the concepts in your memory so in the previous class we extensively spoke about the two differences geminal and vicinal so if you are not able to recollect the fault lies in very simple its lack of practice so the reddish orange color of bromine solution in carbon tetrachloride is discharged during this reaction when bromine adds to an unsaturation site so what does the statement talk about the statement basically talks about what is the reaction that's happening bromine and carbon tetrachloride is the reagent that is used to carry out bromination or addition of bromine now when this reaction happens the bromine solution in carbon tetrachloride initially will be brown in color reddish orange uh, to be more specific reddish orange in color now during the course of this reaction this color will change it will get discharged indicating that there is some reaction that's happened and what is the reaction that's happened this reaction is addition of bromine this test is used as a test for unsaturation this is very very important what is a test for unsaturation it is bromine water in carbon tetrachloride you if somebody gives you a sample of a compound and tells you that it is unsaturated how do you confirm that it is unsaturated simple so take the test tube with the sample add bromine water a bromine solution in carbon tetrachloride the moment you add that if the reddish orange color is discharged this confirms that the compound in question is unsaturated in nature yeah so this reaction is an electrophilic addition reaction in uh, the concepts in the basic concepts of organic chemistry you understood the concept called as an electrophile and a nucleophile we spoke about uh, homolysis and heterolysis right where uh, you can break a compound in two different ways when we carry out heterolysis or unequal breakage there is result in the formation of radicals uh, called as electrophiles or nucleophiles or we also call them as ions electrophilic addition is the addition of an electrophile an electrophile will get added during the course of the reaction so in this case bromination is an electrophilic addition reaction let's take an example to understand this is ethene when ethene reacts with bromine in the presence of carbon tetrachloride i get 1,2 dibromoethane which is a vicinal dihalide yeah so vicinal dihalide is a dihalide where the halogen atoms are attached to the adjacent carbon atoms so who is a geminal dihalide where both the halogens are attached to the same carbon atom so that's a geminal dihalide a vicinal dihalide is a dihalide where halogen atoms are attached to two different carbon atoms or the adjacent carbon atoms this is a reaction to indicate addition of halogen clear let's solve a few mcqs ch2 double bond ch2 eth in the presence of x at 120 degrees gives c2h6 the reagent x is what now look at this question look at this reaction find out what has happened during the course of this reaction an alkene having the general formula c2h4 is converted to c2h6 
So from C to H4, it is converted to C to H6. That means during the course of the reaction, hydrogen is added. So two hydrogen atoms are added so that the molecular formula becomes C2H6. Addition of hydrogen is carried out by what? Let's give you an example here in the form of options. Option A, is it nickel? Option B, is it palladium? Option B, C, is it platinum? Or option D, is it all the above? Pretty straightforward, right? If you did not observe the reaction carefully when I explained it a few minutes ago, you will easily mark option A as the answer because you would remember finely divided nickel. But when we spoke about this reaction, we said along with nickel, we can also use palladium. We can also use platinum. So therefore, the answer is all the above. Alkene plus hydrogen in the presence of nickel gives an alkane. Regarding this reaction, which of the following is a correct statement? Hybridization of alkene changes from sp2 to sp3. Bond length of carbon-carbon double bond increases. Bond length at each carbon increases from 120 degrees to 109 degrees. In fact, this should be bond angle not bond length, option D, all the above. So when an alkene is converted to an alkane, which of the following things happen? Go through the statements, try to guess what the correct answer is. Got the answer? All right, so we know that when an alkene is converted to an alkane, the bond length actually, what happens? Bond angle, does it increase to 120 degrees? Alkanes are sp3 hybridized. So since they are sp3 hybridized, the bond angle will change. hybridization of alkene changes from sp2 to sp3. Okay, so that's your answer. Continue further with the next reaction, which is called as addition of hydrogen halide, which is also called hydrohalogenation. So addition of hydrogen is called hydrogenation. Addition of halogen is called halogenation. Addition of hydrogen and halogen is called hydrohalogenation. So this is the third reaction that we will try to understand. One of the most important reactions from this uh, concept. The addition of hydrogen halide across the double bond of an alkene is known as hydrohalogenation. As we just spoke to you right now, let's take an example. If you take an alkene, if it reacts with HX, which is a hydrogen halide, hydrogen will add on to one of the carbon atoms, halogen will add on to the next carbon atom, giving us this compound, which is called as an alkyl halide. Yeah. So during this reaction, there is formation of an alkyl halide. Now, one thing is pretty straightforward out of all the three reactions that you've studied so far. All the three of them are quite similar. In the first case, there's addition of hydrogen, where one hydrogen adds to one carbon atom of the double bond and the other hydrogen atom adds to the other carbon of the double bond. In the second case, it was halogenation, where both the halogens got attached to the respective carbon atoms of the double bond. And in the third case, addition of hydrogen and halogen, the hydrogen will add to one of the carbon atoms and the halogen will add to the other carbon atoms involved in the double bond. Got that giving us an alkyl halide. Now, there are two cases where we can understand this particular scenario, addition of hydrogen and halogen. First one, if I start with a symmetrical alkene. Now, who is a symmetrical alkene? A symmetrical alkene is an alkene where if I break the compound across the double bond, I get two equal parts. For example, ethene. If I take ethene, 
I can break it at the center. When I break it at the center, I will get two equal parts. Such an alkene is called as a symmetrical alkene. Now, when I take a symmetrical alkene and add it with HCl, hydrogen can add to any one of these carbon atoms, halogen can add to any one of these carbon atoms, giving us ethyl chloride or chloroethane. Now, the product will be the same irrespective of whether hydrogen acts to the first carbon or hydrogen acts to the second carbon. Clear? Because the name of the product will still be the same. Hence, we get only one product. Let me take one more example to understand. Butuene. Yeah. Is this symmetrical or unsymmetrical? If you break the compound across the double bond, see whether you are getting two equal parts. You will get two equal parts. Hence, this is a symmetrical alkene. So when I take a symmetrical alkene and add HBr, hydrogen can either add to carbon 2 or it can add to carbon 3. Likewise, bromine can either add to carbon 2 or it can add to carbon 3. Irrespective of whether any one of these happens, the final product will remain the same. So there is, I do not have multiple products being formed. Okay? Because whether H adds to the carbon 2 or whether H adds to carbon 3, there's not going to be any difference to the final product that is obtained, which is 2-bromobutane. Now, the order of reactivity is like this. HI is more reactive than HBr, which is in turn more reactive than HCl. So, order of reactivity among hydrogen allies is HI is more reactive than HBr, which is in turn more reactive than HCl. I want you to take this as a homework. Find out why do you see this order? Why is HI more reactive than HBr, which is in turn more reactive than HCl? The second case is addition of the hydrogen and halogen to an unsymmetrical aldehyde. Now, as the name itself indicates, unsymmetrical aldehyde or sorry, unsymmetrical alkene is an alkene where if I break the compound across the double bond, I get two unequal parts. For example, this, which is propene. If I take propene and I break it across the double bond, are you getting two equal parts? No, you don't. On one side, you get CH2. On the other side, you get CH single bond, CH3. Such an alkene is called as an unsymmetrical alkene. Okay. Now, when I take an unsymmetrical alkene and react it with HPR, now bromine can either attack CH or it can attack CH2. Likewise, hydrogen can attack CH2 or it can attack CH. Imagine if bromine attacks CH2 and hydrogen attacks CH. What will be the product obtained? The product obtained will be this. Yeah, if bromine attacked CH and hydrogen attacked CH2, the product will be this. CH3, CH, Br, CH3. Clear? Imagine it happened the other way around. If bromine attacked CH2 and hydrogen attacked CH, the product obtained will be this, which is 1-bromopropane. Now, here it is pretty straightforward that both these compounds are not the same. Whereas in the previous case, when we start, uh, took butuene or when we took ethene, both of them were symmetrical alkenes. In the case of symmetrical alkenes, irrespective of whether the hydrogen adds to the first carbon or whether it adds to the second carbon, the products were the same. Whereas, when I look at the unsymmetrical alkene here and the addition, there is going to be a difference. There is a change, whether hydrogen adds to the first carbon or whether it adds to the second carbon. Because the two products that are formed are not the same, they are different. Clear? Now, whenever we get two products, 
usually it is not going to be formed in equal quantities. It's not, it's not that uh, both the products will be formed in 50-50% quantity. One of them will be formed in larger quantity and the other one will be formed in smaller quantity. We call the product that is obtained in larger quantity as what? Yes, it is called as the major product and the product that is obtained in smaller quantity is called as the minor product. Now, in the previous class, we already came across this concept, major product and minor product. Can you guess the rule? Can you guess the reaction where we came across that? Yeah, the rule was Seidseff's rule. And we came across that for dehydrohalogenation of alkyl halide to prepare an alkene. Dehydrohalogenation is removal of hydrogen and halogen. And even there, remember which alkyl halide we applied states of rule for? It was for an unsymmetrical alkyl halide and not a symmetrical alkyl halide. So you can see a, a lot of parallels here. There, the reaction is dehydrohalogenation. Here, the reaction is hydrohalogenation. There, you started with an unsymmetrical alkyl halide. Here, you start with an unsymmetrical alkene. There, it was Seidseff's rule. Here, it is Markovnikov's rule. So, there's one more rule that comes into picture. Very, very, very important. Seidseff's rule as well as Markovnikov's rule. Here, to determine the major product, we use a rule called as Markovnikov's rule. Now, what is Markovnikov's rule? Look at the statement carefully. When an unsymmetrical alkene reacts with an unsymmetrical reagent, the negative part of the reagent gets added to the carbon atom containing less number of hydrogens across the carbon-carbon double bond. Okay, let me repeat it once again. When an unsymmetrical alkene reacts with an unsymmetrical reagent, then the negative part of the reagent gets added to the carbon atom containing less number of hydrogens across the carbon-carbon double bond. This is Markovnikov's rule. The statement looks large, statement looks big, but trust me, the moment you look at the example, the moment we try to explain it using the example, you will be able to clearly understand what Markovnikov's rule is all about. So let's try to explain it with the form of an example. I take propene. Now, propene, is it unsymmetrical or symmetrical? Yes, it is unsymmetrical. And it is made to react with HBr. Now, is this compound unsymmetrical? Is this reagent unsymmetrical or symmetrical? How do you find that out? You just try to break it across the bond. Now, if I break it across the bond, do I get two equal parts? No, I don't. On one side, I get hydrogen and on the other side, I get bromine. So, which means this is an unsymmetrical alkene, uh, so unsymmetrical reagent. Now, what is it telling me? Unsymmetrical, from the unsymmetrical reagent, whoever is negative, now who's negative here? Bromine. Will add to the carbon of the double bond having less number of hydrogens. Now, there are two carbons here which are having the double bond. The terminal one has two hydrogens, CH2, and the one in the middle has only one hydrogen. So, according to Markovnikov's rule, the negative part of this reagent will add to carbon of the double bond having less number of hydrogen atoms. So, therefore, bromine will add to CH and not CH2. If bromine adds to CH2, then naturally hydrogen will add to CH2. So bromine, if it adds to CH, hydrogen will add to CH2. If by chance bromine adds to CH2, then hydrogen adds to CH. Now, according to Markovnikov's rule, who's negative here? Out of HBr, Br is negative because Br is electronegative, more electronegative compared to hydrogen. Therefore, it pulls the electrons of the bond towards it, thereby retaining or getting a partial negative charge. So, therefore, that is the negative part. 
So the negative part of this molecule, according to Markovnikov's rule, will attack CH and D. Hydrogen, which is the positive part, will attack CH2, giving us the two products. The first one is this, if bromine attacked CH. The second one is this, if bromine attacked the terminal carbon. Now, Markovnikov's rule clearly states which one of these two products are favored. Yes. Two bromopropane will be the major product and one bromopropane will be the minor product. So this is Markovnikov's rule. So now let us again go back to Markovnikov's rule to understand it. When unsymmetrical alkene in the previous example, it is propene reacts with unsymmetrical reagent. Unsymmetrical reagent is nothing but HBr. The negative part of the reagent, now who is the negative part of the reagent? Bromine. Gets added to the carbon atom containing less number of hydrogen atoms across the carbon-carbon double bond. So we had CH double bond CH2, correct? So negative part, which is bromine, will add to CH and not add to CH2. Hence, giving the major product as 2-bromopropane. We will also get a few percentage, a small percentage of the other product where bromine adds on to CH2 and hydrogen adds on to CH, giving us 1-bromopropane. But we've already seen that that is a minor product. Clear? You don't need to understand the mechanism uh, as part of your syllabus, uh, but just remember the mechanism of addition of hydrogen halogen is an electrophilic addition reaction. So what is the name of that reaction? It's an electrophilic addition reaction. I'll be creating one more video where I will be talking exclusively about the mechanism. So until uh, that happens, you don't need to worry about this. So we will quickly skip it. Yeah, so let's solve an MCQ until before we go to the next concept. Hex one in reacts with HBr to give as what? Hex one in reacts with HBr to give us what? Option A, one bromohexane. Option B, two bromohexane. Option C, one comma two dibromohexane. And option D, 2,3 dibromohexane. Now you can clearly eliminate options C and D because we are not adding Br2. We are not adding two bromine atoms. Only when we do halogenation will you get a dihalo compound. So option C and D can be eliminated. That leaves us with option A and B. If bromine attacks the first carbon, you get one bromohexane. If bromine attacks the second carbon of the double bond, you get two bromohexane. According to Markovnikov's rule, which is preferred? Yes. Two bromohexane will be preferred. That's your major product. One bromohexane is your minor product. Okay, I hope it is pretty straightforward. During the hydrobromination of unsymmetrical alkene by means of peroxides in presence of sunlight, the reaction proceeds through elimination, addition, substitution, or molecular rearrangement. During the hydrobromination of unsymmetrical alkene, by means of peroxides in the presence of sunlight, the reaction proceeds through what? So here, he's talking about the same reaction, addition of hydrogen and halogen in the presence of a peroxide catalyst. Now, what is going to happen if you carry out the reaction in the presence of a 
peroxide catalyst is what is the question. It will again go through addition reaction, giving you a product. That's what is our concept for the next reaction or the next rule, anti Markovnikov's rule. Now, what does anti Markovnikov's rule state? If addition of HBr is carried out in the presence of sunlight and peroxide, such as sodium peroxide or benzoyl peroxide, the addition can proceed opposite to that of Markovnikov's rule. So addition will proceed opposite to that of Markovnikov's rule. So whatever we studied in Markovnikov, that will not happen. It will happen exactly opposite of that. This is known as peroxide effect or Karash effect or anti Markovnikov's rule. So as the name itself indicates, anti means against. So against Markovnikov's rule. Now, when is this anti Markovnikov's rule applicable? It is only applicable in the presence of a peroxide. And it is only applicable for addition of HBr. That's clearly indicated that it is HBr. It is not any other uh, HX. It's not applicable for HCl, not applicable for HI, but it is only applicable for HBr in the presence of a peroxide. So let's try to understand what this effect is all about, how this rule alters the products. We'll, stay, we'll start with the same starting compound, which is propene, which is unsymmetrical. This is made to react with HBr, which is again unsymmetrical. Now, there are two options for the formation of the products. It can either be two bromopropane or it can be one bromopropane, correct? Just like what we studied in the previous case. If Markovnikov's rule was applicable, which would have been the major product? Yes, two bromopropane would have been the major product because the halogen would have attacked the carbon of the double bond having less number of hydrogens, which is CH. Whereas in the presence of a peroxide, the rule will be anti Markovnikov's rule. It means it will go against Markovnikov's rule. So in this case, in Karash effect, what is going to happen is the halogen will attach to the carbon having more number of hydrogens, thereby the hydrogen will attach to the carbon having lesser number of hydrogens. So if that happens, one bromopropane will be the major product and two bromopropane will be the minor product. This is just the reversal. Yeah, reversal when you compare it with Markovnikov's rule. So very, very, very important. So one or one question from Either Markovnikov's or anti Markovnikov's is surely going to come in your, bo in your uh, board examination as well as competitive. So, this concept is extremely important. So, you need to know when Markovnikov's rule is applicable, when anti Markovnikov's rule is applicable. So, it is clear that if I take HBr and in the presence of an unsymmetrical alkene, in the absence of peroxide, Markovnikov's rule will be followed. If you take HBr, and add it to an alkene in the presence of a peroxide, then anti Markovnikov's rule is applicable. Okay. And anti Markovnikov's rule is only applicable for addition of HBr. Please remember this. I'm repeating this multiple times because this has been one favorite question of uh, examiners in competitive. It is only applicable for HBr and not for HI or HCl. Clear? You might wonder why is that so? So you can take that as one more homework for additional reading. Why it is only with respect to HBr and why is it not applicable with respect to HCl or HI? So very, very important that you should know this. Now, in the previous case, we looked at the mechanism of Markovnikov's rule. Markovnikov's rule proceeded via which mechanism? Yes, electrophilic addition mechanism. Whereas when you look at the mechanism with respect to anti Markovnikov's, it is free radical mechanism. Yeah, so that is why you get two different products. The mechanism is entirely different. In the case of Markovnikov's rule, it is 
electrophilic addition the, which is the mechanism in the case of anti makonikov's rule it is free radical mechanism that is what is happening so as in the previous case you don't need to uh, worry much about the mechanism at this point of time i will be making a separate video which will involve the mechanism of both makonikov's rule as well as anti makonikov's rule that will help you in understanding the mechanisms better that is for your additional reading so i will not go into any one of these right now all right so very important anti makonikov rule are only applicable for hbr peroxide and sunlight only and makonikov rule and anti makonikov rule are only applicable to unsymmetrical alkynes it is not applicable for symmetrical alkynes so very very important note that you need to remember let's solve a few mcqs before we close today's class karas effect can be studied in the case of octforene hex3ene pent2ene or but2ene so karas effect can be studied in the case of he is given you four alkenes now he is not telling you whether there is peroxide or whether it, there is no peroxide he is given you the alkene so if you clearly understood the rule and conditions you know that makonikov's rule or anti makonikov's rule it's only applicable in the case of unsymmetrical alkenes it's not applicable in the case of symmetrical alkenes so the way forward for this question is very simple identify which one of which among them is unsymmetrical that will be your answer so when you solve when you write down the structures pent to ene will be unsymmetrical whereas every other compound is symmetrical in nature so look at this propene with hcl in the presence of peroxide and sunlight it gives two products two chloropropane and one chloropropane the major product is a is it b is it both a and b or is it none of the above this is just to find out whether you have understood the concept or not when propene is reacted with hcl in the presence of peroxide and sunlight will i get two chloropropane or will i get one chloropropane the first and foremost is peroxide effect applicable here is anti makonikov's rule applicable here is the question if you clearly listen to me and if you saw the note that was posted it was informed it was explained that peroxide effect is only applicable for addition of hbr and no other hydrogen halide now who's hydrogen halide here it is hcl so hcl in the presence of peroxide or in the absence of peroxide will only give us makonikov's product and makonikov's product is option a clear yeah. so until before we move to the next part of the chemical properties i want you to take the homework for today the homework for today is simple but needs a lot of practice explain makonikov's rule with an example that's your first question second question explain anti makonikov's rule with an example so write each one of these three three times so that you are able to register that in your memory and also better understand the concept okay so very very important we will continue the next set of chemical properties in the upcoming class until then keep practicing namaste